So needless to say, it has been an exciting eight months of ministry since we started our time on deputation. And we are really looking forward to today to be able to share an update on what God has been doing in our lives and in our ministry since we started this back in February. So it's going to be a combination of about three things this morning. The first is a short introduction to who we are and what our ministry is. Maybe there are people here today who were not here last October when we shared what God was leading my wife and my family to, to leave the ministry that we were at in Sutter Salem Bible Church and transition to um, from pastoral ministry to church planting. So if you do not know yet, we are the Robbins family. My name is Nathan, my wife is Christy, and we have three children. Our oldest daughter is Amelia, then Margaret, and our son is Haddon. You will most surely see or hear them around here today. And what I always like to do at the start of a presentation or when we're at a new church is I tell people, I want to introduce you a little bit to who we are as people. Some of our interests, some of the things that we enjoy that make up our personality. And many of you probably could give a pretty good description of me or maybe my wife. But the reason we do that is this. It is our firm belief that God desires to use each one of his children in their unique giftings, loves, and desires to open the door for the gospel. So when we introduce who we are as people, you're getting a glimpse of what our daily ministry is going to look like. So my wife and I, some of the things that we love, we love interacting with people. And generally, that'll involve a cup of coffee. My wife is a coffee roaster. We love to play games and talk and read and listen to music. So in our ministry, what that looks like is discipleship. Having people into our homes, at a coffee shop, fellowshipping, but not just for the sake of interaction, for the sake of coming alongside people to grow to be more like Christ. Our kids have many interests. Our girls love art and music and dolls, but they also love people. It has been a true joy to see them interact over these last months as we go in different churches and stay in people's homes and how they can instantly break down barriers or discomfort and open the door to build genuine relationships around the gospel. Our son Haddon is all boy and generally his role in the ministry is running into people and then as we apologize we take the opportunity to build a relationship. But that's a little bit more about our family and our ministry is we are missionary church planners with Continental Baptist Missions. Continental Baptist Missions is a mission that focuses on planting, revitalizing, and building biblically sound and spiritually healthy Baptist churches in North America. We are going as missionaries to the city of Buffalo, New York to plant a church. So that is a little bit about who we are, both as people of our ministry and what I want to do the rest of the time today is going to be two parts. The first is I want to share from God's word. We're going to be looking in Matthew chapter 5, a passage of scripture that God has been using lately in my life to challenge me on the impact of church planting. But the reason that the sermon title is the impact of church planting is because of how it's impacting me, but the same passage of scripture should impact each follower of Christ. And it should challenge them from this passage on the impact their life should have on the world around them. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5, specifically verses 13 through 17 this morning. The broader context of this passage is Matthew chapters 5 through 7. These three chapters make up one of Christ's most famous sermons entitled the Sermon on the Mount. In this sermon, what Christ does is he essentially is addressing his audience and he's challenging them on the impact or on what their life as a follower of Christ should look like and the impact that has on the kingdom of God. 
He starts off by giving a list called the Beatitudes, a passage you are probably familiar with. I like to call the Beatitudes the marks of saving grace. Because in those first 12 verses of the chapter, what he does is he basically goes down and he gives characteristics of what the life of a, a believer should look like in contrast to oftentimes what the world's expectation is. So you'll see with me beginning in verse 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. When others revile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And then look at verse 12. What does he say? Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets before you. What Christ was doing at the very introduction of this sermon was this. He was looking out at his audience. It would have been largely a, a Jewish believing audience that he was preaching to. And he's essentially telling them, the world around you has different expectations. They are living for different things than you are. These are the characteristics of what your life should reflect and represent as a follower of Christ. And it is for those characteristics... That you will be rewarded one day. It's a very fitting message for today. Coming off of a, a highly contested election cycle. We're still in it actually. If you follow Facebook, if you've had any conversations, you will quickly find out that many of the responses and attitudes around us today are not reflecting this passage. It's no different today than it was 2,000 years ago. Our natural tendency, both as believers and unbelievers, because of the fall, is to respond in a way that does not give glory to God and thus does not impact the world in which we live for the sake of the gospel. So just as Christ did 2,000 years ago, we can look at this passage and take the next three verses, or four verses, that we're going to focus on this morning as a challenge for us today. So what Christ does is, he, he builds off of those marks of saving grace, and he gives two metaphors. Two metaphors for the life of the redeemed, the impact they should have. And I love what Christ does. Picture this, if you will. Three years ago, almost to the week, I had the privilege of going to Israel. One of the places we went while we were in Israel was referred to as the Mount of Beatitudes, and it was on the, the very north end of the Sea of Galilee. So we're, we're on this Mount of Beatitudes, and we're standing in the place that most likely Christ gave this sermon. We're looking out down south over the Sea of Galilee, and the sea is in kind of a bowl, so you have ridge lines surrounding it. And, and down on, it would be your right when you're standing on the mountain, there's this huge plain that is down there, and it's referred to as the Salt Plain. So what Christ was doing was, he was literally taking his audience, taking their surroundings and using illustrations that they would connect with to make a point. So he points down at this salt plain and goes, you are the salt of the earth. And then up on his left was this, this mountain or this ridge line, and there was a city located on the very top. A city who at night, the lights from the lamps would be able to be seen from that whole valley while you're out on the lake, while you're out on the ridge line, the mountains surrounding. And he points up there and he goes, you are the light to the world. You've probably heard that phrase many times. 
As believers, we are to be the salt and the light to the world. But what does that mean? What was Christ teaching and implying with those statements? That's what we want to look at this morning. So the first metaphor was, you are the salt of the earth. In this first metaphor, Paul paints a vivid picture of the impact that the life of followers of Christ should have on the world in which they live. You see, salt is used generally for two things. It's used to both season, to give flavor to what it is put on, but it is also used as a preservative. For in that valley that he was pointing at, all the fishermen would pull the fish off the Sea of Galilee and they would bring up the salt from the Dead Sea. And when they packed that fish in the salt, it would both flavor it, but it would also allow it to last. So when using this metaphor, he is pointing to the positive aspects that the life of a believer should have. Your life should season and preserve the world in which you live. So the first point I have there is the life of the redeemed should be a powerful representation of the image of God to a lost world. I have a question for you. Have you ever thought about how much worse the world would be today if it was not for Believers. We look around us all the time and see how the effects of depravity and the fall are affecting us. We see things that we hate. We see wickedness. But have you ever thought about how much worse it would be without believers? In fact, Scripture is full of examples of where God chooses to bless and preserve aspects of his image for the sake of a few. Look at just the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, we see in Genesis 19 where God would have been willing to spare Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of ten righteous. In Genesis 30, we see where God blessed Laban for Jacob's sake. In Genesis 39, we see where the household of Potiphar was blessed because of Joseph's testimony. So what do we see in those examples in the Old Testament? We see that as a follower of Christ, it it does not matter how wicked the world is in which we live, our life can still be used to have an impact to represent the image of God upon the world around us, even if we don't always see the outcome. In fact, there's several books in the Old Testament that remind us of that. The books of the minor and major prophets and judges are full of where in Israel's history, as a nation, when they turned their back on God, God preserved prophets and judges to go and call people back to him. In the Great Commission in Matthew 28, we are the people who are called to go and make disciples. So in Christy and I's life, when we go to Buffalo, that is what we are seeking to do. To impact a lost world, to season and preserve it with the image of God, so that people will see their need of a Savior and trust Him. But that's also what each one of us here today has the privilege and opportunity to do. The second thing, beside preserving, is to season Professor Joel Beek says this, As the salt of the earth, God's people exert an influence of righteousness and goodness in a world that is corrupted by sin. Now, I want to say after that quote, this fact, that does not mean it will always be easy. That does not mean that if we are faithfully following Christ, faithfully exerting an influence of Christ to the world around us, that everything will go our way and the outcome will come as we desire. Another quote from John Stott said this, It does not matter whether we live among a people who are predominantly secular, Roman Catholic, Islamic, Hindu, Buddhist, or as Christ did, Jewish. 
If we live according to the word of God, we will face persecution and opposition for our faith. Have you ever thought about that? Christ lived in a very religious, very moral society. And yet he faced more opposition and persecution than we could ever dream. So it doesn't have to do with the outward appearance. It has to do with the heart. And as a follower of Christ, it is our heart and our life that should be pointing people to God and seasoning the world around us. Christ makes this positive statement, but he does not stop there. He follows it up by saying this, that the life of the redeemed loses its power when it is not preserving God's image to a lost world. Verse 13b, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. When you first read that, it doesn't seem to make sense, right? If we are the salt, salt is always going to season and preserve. That, that's in its very chemical nature, right? What Christ knew, and he was using his surrounding again, was that the circumstances or surroundings can influence the effect of that salt. In fact, the salt in the Dead Sea is only between 14 and 15% pure sodium chloride. The environment has leached out the salt and replaced it with other minerals. So what Christ is saying, if that has happened in your life, you still are salt. You can't lose your salvation if you've trusted in Christ. You still can have an impact, but you can lose your effectiveness. And he says, if your life has lost its effectiveness, if you as a follower of Christ are no longer preserving the image of God and seasoning and impacting the world in which you live, your life is good for nothing. That is a sobering reminder to me. And it's not just a blanket statement that we can go, I've arrived, now my life is doing this. It's a constant reminder that Christ is challenging us with in this passage of who we are living for and what our lives are to be spent doing. I have an illustration I want to share that is a vivid reminder in my own life. I wish my mom was up here. When I was in junior high, I had the opportunity to go turkey hunting for the first time. My dad actually went with me, and it was an awesome morning hunt. A large old tom came out. I was able to harvest it and, and had a beautiful fan, a 11 and a half inch beard, inch and a quarter spurs. Awesome hunt. And I wanted to preserve that fan, that turkey tail, and put it on my wall. So I, I did some reading, and I, I don't remember exactly, but they said, you know, you got to cut it off and put salt on it and pin it on a board to preserve. Well, I don't know. I think I was paranoid that it would fall apart. I left a lot of meat on that tail. A lot of meat. And I put, it, put salt on it, and we went on vacation or somewhere, a conference, I can't remember, and I put that board with salt on it in our basement storage room. Heated basement storage room. We came back after a number of days, and I ran down there to check on it, and guess what I found? Maggots. Hundreds of maggots. Everywhere. I didn't know they could crawl. They were everywhere. That was a bad day in the Robbins household. But isn't that a beautiful picture? Is salt what I still used to preserve that turkey tail? You guys can answer that question. I did, right? But I had not put enough salt on there to have an impact. Even though the salt was present, it still rotted. It still stank. That is what Christ is using in this metaphor. He's going, you are the salt of the earth. Your life can and should have an impact on the world around you. But if it is not present, if it has lost its saltiness, it is good for nothing. The second metaphor that Christ gives is you are the light of the world. In many ways, this metaphor builds off and restates the same things that he had said about being the salt of the earth. 
In this metaphor, he is pointing people to, the, to two main facts. The fact that you are a light in darkness implies that we are living in a dark, sinful world. But, in saying that we are the light, he is challenging them that our lives are to be reflectors shining forth the light. So the first thing is that light penetrates darkness. He uses the illustration of the city set upon a hill. There's another image that came to mind from my time in Israel. Have you guys ever seen the little clay oil lamps that they used back in Jesus' time? They're about this big. And you would fill them with oil and set them in a pot of water, and then you would light them. I bought two of them while I was in Israel. Reproductions. Cheap. One of them got shattered very quickly. I found out very quickly that if it falls on a hardwood floor in your office, it does not fare well. All of a sudden, that little clay lamp was good for nothing, right? It was fragile, it was small, it was insignificant. But when you would light it, if you put it up on a shelf, what did it do? It it shined a fairly good amount of light. That's what Christ is using here. He's going, on our own, we are kind of fragile, small, and insignificant. You don't purposely take those small lights and put them under a basket or throw them on the ground and fracture them. What do you do? You put them up high so people can see. So he's going, yes, you are one light in your life, but if you shine forth, your life can have an impact on the world around it. And ultimately, Christ referred to himself as the light of the world. So as being the light to the world, we are to be reflecting Christ. This is why Christy and I are here today. That's why we are moving to Buffalo, is to shine the light of the gospel to a city in darkness. That is what each one of us who have placed our hope and trust in Christ alone and what he accomplished on the cross to save us are to do. We are to reflect the light of Christ for the sake of the gospel. The second thing is the negative aspect. The do not hide or limit the light of the gospel. He said there, In verse 15, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. The third point, then, is we are created to give glory to God. He says in verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others. Why? So that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. How do people respond when they are around us? Who do they give praise and glory to? What are we seeking when we start conversations, when we post on Facebook, when we interact with our friends, family, and the community? Are we purposely seeking to reflect the light of Christ, to season and preserve the lost world so that glory is given to God Or are we oftentimes wanting that light to reflect back on us? To our words, to our stands, to our beliefs. And in fact, Christ knew that because as he continues on in the Sermon on the Mount, I encourage you to go read it later, he he goes through a pointed three-part illustration using the Pharisees and showing how they will receive a reward for their actions. But he says, you will either receive your reward on earth, or you will receive it in heaven. It continues to build off of these metaphors that Christ is giving. That Christ gave to his audience 2,000 years ago, then preserved in his word to challenge us with today. That is the impact of church planting that God has been challenging Christy and I with. The impact that us going to Buffalo is one small way that he desires to use us 
to penetrate the darkness and to preserve and enhance God's presence in a fallen world. So if you are here today and have trusted Christ as your Savior, that is God's desire for you. To penetrate the darkness and to preserve and season in this lost, fallen, dying world the image of God so that he will receive the glory. Hopefully that was an encouragement to you today. That's a small glimpse of some of the things that God has really been teaching us lately. And I wanted to share that message this morning because as we give an update on the ministry, I want God to receive the glory. He's done tremendous things, but during these last eight months, there have been many times of growth and examination of our own heart, of our own motives. And the reminder that our lives, not just when we get to Buffalo, but where we are now, are to have an impact upon the world for Christ. The remainder of our time this morning is going to be spent giving a more traditional update on where we are at in our ministry. So what we want to look at next is the location of the church plant. So one of the things we hadn't shared or didn't even know a year ago when we were here was where exactly in the city of Buffalo we were going to plant. It's been exciting to talk with many, many pastors in western New York and to hear their heart and their burden and vision for the city of Buffalo and to learn from them the areas of greatest need. From that, along with our own time spent in the city and looking at different things, we have determined that we are going to be planting a church in the neighborhood of Five Points. The phrase to describe Five Points is taken from actually the Buffalo Niagara Tourist website. They describe it as the perfect union of diversity and culture. It literally is an intersection of Five Points, much like the one in our area. In fact, my, my dad challenged me to encourage you as you drive through Five Points, use it as a reminder to pray for Christy and I and for the Five Points in Buffalo. But it's a wonderful neighborhood because of its location. It has a unique identity in and of itself, but within walking distance, literally within a half of a mile of this intersection where the neighborhood spreads out, there are three to four distinct cultures. The zip code in which that is located is 24,000 people, and that zip code is the highest number per capita of refugees in the entire state of New York. There are literally people coming from all over the world, from Venezuela, Syria, North Africa, seeking asylum, seeking immigration into our country, and that is an open door, even as the Apostle Paul exemplified in Scripture, to go to the people so they can send back and go forth. It's also located a half a mile from Elmwood Avenue, which is one of the, the main streets in Buffalo that is seeing a lot of revitalization. So in that direction, there are a lot of younger families, professionals moving in, desiring to live, to work, to play in the community in which they are living. But it's also located within walking distance of long-term neighborhoods. People that, for many reasons, never left this city, even during the, the, the recession when hundreds of thousands of people were moving out into the suburbs. People that are tied and rooted to the history of Buffalo, but they need the gospel. Some characteristics of five points are the cultural diversity, which I mentioned. Broad ethnic diversity, young professionals, long-term residents. One thing that Christy and I were really praying about was where did we feel we could, with our personalities and giftings, have an effective ministry? One thing that drew us to this neighborhood is it almost has a discipleship culture already. If you walk around, there are community gardens spread out on all of these empty lots. Places where people from all of the community, from all broad backgrounds, come to, to grow and to plant what a natural place to build relationships. 
There's also three diners or coffee shops located within walking distance, places where people gather. There's farmer's markets. It is a place where people come to build relationships. There is a unique identity and ownership if you live in that neighborhood. But it's also an area that has sustainability, both from an economic viewpoint as well as places to rent to be able to start the church. So it is exciting to share how God has opened this door and the, the direction that he has provided over these past months. The second thing that I want to share with is kind of the process of church planting. What does it look like? I'm sure that's a question that has crossed many of your minds. It's a question that we have asked, wrestled with, studied, and prayed over for several years and still probably do not have definitive answers. But here's some guidance. When we move, we will strive to do much of what we are doing now, but in that community. The first is be present. I don't know if you've ever driven around a, a large residential neighborhood and made the observation, does anyone even live here? You don't see cars, you don't see kids playing, you see all of the blinds shut. They're not out having cookouts, they're not out that. So our desire is to basically be the opposite of that when we move there. Be in our community. Be in our yard, go for walks, go to the farmer's markets, the gardens, the activities, the festivals, but not just so we can participate, so we can be purposeful. Meeting people, learning their names, learning their fears, their hopes, their desires. The third is a reminder for myself. Be considerate. One thing I have found in life and ministry is that oftentimes, the things that we have prayed for, the way that God answers does not look like what we expected. And oftentimes I've found in my own life that I've missed opportunities to minister, to share the gospel, to build relationships with people because it would have put me outside of my comfort zone. So I have that as a reminder that as we are being present, building relationships, we will be willing to put others first. Not just do life and ministry in our own little box that we are comfortable, but for the sake of penetrating the darkness, of seasoning and preserving the world, step outside of our comfort zone for the sake of Christ. The fourth is be bold. The gospel is offensive. The gospel cuts at the very heart of who we are without Christ. We are lost, sinful human beings already condemned to spend eternity in hell. But God loved us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross. But that first part of the message is harsh. We are striving to build relationships, but what we are not striving to do is build a relationship with the hope of some point reaching a place where it will be easy or natural to share the gospel. Because very likely that point will never come. So while we are there, we will be bold to take every opportunity to speak how God is growing us, the truth of his word, and the hope that is in Christ every chance we meet. And fifth is to be consistent. I remember sharing a year ago that as we were praying about where to go, two things we were praying for. Number one, it had to be an area that had a tremendous need for gospel influence. And number two, we desired it to be an area that had other churches or groups of believers that we could partner with. That is why partnership with our sending church, with individuals, with other churches here and in Buffalo is so important. Because we need accountability and prayer and partners both here and on the ground to help not just us, but to help one another fulfill the Great Commission where God has us. So that looks what it looks like when we moved. Second is when we meet. I had always thought about what the core values of my ministry were when I was pastoring, but I had never taken the time to really formally put them down. I've had the opportunity to do that during deputation. So this is basically what 
the core values that we are wanting to have in our church. Now, this is not our doctrinal statement. But this is what we will be teaching and living out as we are there. The first is gospel-centered. Gospel-centered means this. It means we trust in the finished work of Christ for our salvation and growth, and we strive to effectively balance our beliefs and ministry practices to bring the power of the gospel to our particular cultural setting and historical moment. The gospel is going to influence everything that we do and say as a church. We will then teach that through expository preaching and purposeful discipleship. Expository preaching is simply this. The message of the Word of God and the truth that it contains is the foundation for everything that we do say and preach. Purposeful discipleship is the philosophy that growth does not simply happen. We have to invest in others and instill a culture in our church where growing side-by-side, recognizing our weaknesses and our faults and coming together to become more like Christ is who we are. When we do that, the church becomes a biblical representation of what authentic community looks like. And if there's one thing that we can learn from observing the world around us, people desire authentic community. People desire places where they can go and be loved and accepted And the church, built upon the foundation of the word of God and the gospel, is the greatest example of that. In fact, it is Christ's command, Christ's model that he has given to fulfill that in this world. But then we also want to be a church that goes, gives to our community, and sends out missionaries and missions around the world. The final thing I want to share in the last five minutes is just a visual update and a financial update of where we're at and what we have done over the last eight months. So the progress we have made. I had to start just with a picture of us in front of our mission, kind of showing the start of the process, but then after a very few weeks, here's what our ministry looked like. You probably see many of your faces in there if you look close. We started off by sharing in churches. We were able to share in five different churches in the month of February, in the first two weeks of March, and then COVID hit. And it was four and a half months of online ministry, fellowship, Zoom meetings, but God used that time. I look out here and I see a few different faces that, quite frankly, we got to know a lot better through our Zoom meetings than I had attending church with them growing up or in these months before that. What a blessing. It also looks like times of fellowship with pastors and other individuals. We've been able to stay in some homes and build deep friendships. In fact, over I, I added it up last night. We've been able to share in 18 churches host two Robins to Buffalo nights, and many, many meals and interactions with individuals. We were also able to finally take a three-week trip out to New York. I should show you the text message list from the health department sometime. I probably got over, boy, four to 500 text messages over the 14-day quarantine period. But God works. There was an exemption for essential workers to where while we were quarantining for 14 days, I was still able to go out and do all of the ministry appointments under the governor's order. God is gracious. Our kids loved exploring the city of Buffalo while we were out there. This is them on a bridge at the waterfront, one of the areas that is being revitalized, hosts a lot of festivals. During that time, Amelia started school. So Christy is homeschooling our oldest daughter, and she is loving to learn how to read and write, and God is just gifting her in that, and so thankful for my wife. Christy was able to speak at the Ladies of Faith banquet, and just a tremendous opportunity. We were also able to, just uh, two weeks ago, be able to help out with the missions conference at Appalachian Bible College. 
We were able to speak at some churches down there and be able to represent our mission and engage in conversation with other young people who are preparing to go and serve the Lord with their life. And it was such an encouragement to be able to challenge them on the need of church planting and missions and the joy it is to serve Christ. I was able to show our kids some of our history. They loved finding out where mom and dad met. This is a, a prayer trail at Appalachian. This was part of my senior project in one of my classes. We, we, can, we put this together and built it and made the trail, and it was cool to go through that with our kids and literally pray for the city of Buffalo and our supporting churches at something that 10 years ago God had laid the foundation for. This was just last Sunday. This is, I wanted to show this picture because this is an example of COVID deputation. We were supposed to be in Dale, Indiana last week at Dale Bible Church ministering. And on Tuesday morning, the week of that meeting, I get a call from the pastor and they had a COVID outbreak in their church. So we weren't able to go and they were having to go to online services again. On Thursday of that week, we're driving back and I get a call from another pastor going, we're having our missions conference this weekend and our lead speaker got COVID and can't come. Would you be able to fill in? God's timing is perfect. So rather than being in Dale, Indiana, we were in Peoria, Illinois. And this is actually the church where Janelle and Joanna Bean attend. So it was so much fun to be able to go there and meet their pastor, Pastor Gary Gear, and the people there. And just God has blessed like that so many times. As literally dozens of doors and cancellations have happened over the last eight months, we've also seen dozens of doors open, opportunities to invest in people, to share Christ, to build friendships, to be an encouragement that we would have never had if it hadn't been for COVID. If I had been able to stick to my strict schedule of meetings and my plan. Financially, God is also blessed. We're at 25% of our needed support. We've seen five churches take us on as well as 14 individual partners. And we're truly rejoicing in that. So I wanted to end with ways to be involved. Most of them go unspoken because of how involved you are. And we want to thank you. We value our sending church. Our church family. The encouragement, the prayers, the finances, the example never cease to amaze us. And we cannot wait to see what God has in store as he continues to grow this partnership while we're on deputation, but then also once we get out in Buffalo, New York. I included a screenshot. This is our Facebook page. If you are on Facebook and have not liked Robins to Buffalo, please go there and do that. There is also a link where you can sign up for our prayer updates. If you do not have Facebook, there's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. Please put your name, email. We will send hard copies if you do not have an email. Um, a way that you can follow us that way. There's also a, a link to personal giving on the Facebook page. And then something that is launching this Tuesday, I, I've started a podcast. So it's just a way that we're praying God will use to be able to keep connected with the people and the churches that we're meeting on deputation. So I can get you the web address or the link. It'll also be on all the major podcast hosts. But these are just a couple of new ways that you can follow us, pray for us. But above and beyond that, just reach out to us anytime. Let's get together. Let's fellowship. Let's do life and ministry together. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to be able to share in a little more detail just the tremendous ways that God has been working and give praise and testimony to him. And I pray that the challenge from the word this morning will be something that each one of us will leave here today challenged from his word and grow in that area. That we will see in this world of darkness the gospel penetrate that darkness and that our lives as believers will season and preserve the image of God in a lost world. Let's close in prayer and then I'll have dad come up. Heavenly Father, 
thank you so much for the privilege of being chosen to be your representative in this world. To be able to make disciples. Father, I thank you that it is not a certain few that are called to do that, but it is each one of us. And what a joy. What a blessing to be able to see your name glorified in this world. Father, I pray that you will continually keep our focus on you. Through spending time in your word and prayer, through fellowshipping with the brothers and sisters in Christ, that we will see our lives be this example. Father, I pray that with whatever comes of COVID and the elections in our country, we will never stop seeing your hand at work and the purpose that you have for us on this